So in this video, we're going to try to explain the, both the Great Depression and the Great Recession through the ISLM framework. You remember that John Maynard Keynes primarily came up with the ISLM model in response to the Great Depression. And so right at the start of the Great Depression, we saw unemployment increase really, really significantly. Unemployment went from below 5% in 1929, all the way above 25% by 1933. At the same time, we saw total spending in the economy decrease. We saw GDP fall from about $200 billion in 1929 to below $140 billion in 1933. And Keynes said this decline in spending and this increase in unemployment primarily came from a leftward shift in the IS curve, similar to what we saw in the last video. But that total drop in spending was due to an exogenous shock to the IS curve. We're gonna call this the spending hypothesis. And on its surface, this seems to explain the Great Depression fairly effectively. Throughout the Great Depression, both output and interest rates fell, which is what we would expect from a leftward shift in the IS curve. And as the depression progressed, we saw prices start to fall, which we would predict would happen to bring us back to our long run equilibrium. And Keynes put forward three primary explanations for this leftward shift in the IS curve. First, he said that this leftward shift could have come from the stock market crash in 1929. As the value of stocks started to go down, total household wealth declined. As total household wealth declines, people have to cut back on spending. Basically, they're just not as wealthy. And as a response, they can't spend as much. But he also said that the Great Depression was more complex than just the stock market. It could have also been due to a drop in investment. And so we saw a lot of investment in the 1920s. We saw really fast growth. And it's possible that people started to cut back on investment, simply correcting for overinvesting in the 1920s. At the same time, we saw a lot of bank failures throughout the 1920s. And that made it a lot more difficult to get investment. And so when people actually did want to invest, there were fewer banks there from which they could borrow. Lastly, he said that contractionary fiscal policies in response to World War I could have also shifted the IS curve to the left. And so we saw a lot of increases in taxes and decreases in government spending to try to balance out the significant deficit spending from World War I. And so this contractionary fiscal policy would have shifted the IS curve to the left throughout the 1930s. And this spending hypothesis was the primary rationale put forth for a really long time for the Great Depression. Then in the 1960s, two monetary economists, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz, looked at the money side of the economy throughout the Great Depression. And they came up with the money hypothesis, basically that the depression was entirely a monetary phenomenon. And so they looked at old Federal Reserve records from the Great Depression and found that the money supply fell by over 25% during the Great Depression. They dubbed it the Great Contraction. But on its surface, this somewhat struggles to explain what happened in the Great Depression. Prices fell by more than the money supply. So real money balances, M over P, actually rose slightly at the start of the Great Depression. Put another way, purchasing power of money actually increased through the start of the Great Depression. Similarly, nominal interest rates fell, which is not what we would expect from a leftward shift in the LM curve. We would expect interest rates to increase from that. But we need to think more deeply about what happens when prices fall. So the money hypothesis takes into account that prices fell really significantly throughout the Great Depression. But they assert that this decline in prices is due to the fall in the money supply. So if you think back to the quantity theory of money that we had in chapter five, we said that the money supply and the price level were always going to be really closely related. And so as the money supply fell at the start of the Great Depression, prices then had to respond by falling. And deflation can have really, really significant effects on an economy. And so on its surface, deflation could actually, in theory, be stabilizing. As prices fall, real money balances increase, which shifts the LM curve to the right and increases total spending. This is because of the PIGU effect. Lower prices mean higher real money balances. Basically, it means that people's money goes further. And when people's money goes further, they're going to spend more. They're going to increase consumer spending, which shifts the IS curve to the right and also increases income. 
but deflation can also have fairly significant destabilizing effects. If the deflation is expected, if people know that prices are going to fall, they're going to factor that into interest rates. And so if EPI is negative, remember the Fisher equation that says that nominal interest rates I are equal to real interest rates R plus expected inflation EPI. If nominal interest rates don't change, if I is constant and EPI falls, that means our real interest rate R has to increase. And so for each value of nominal interest rates, because we had expected deflation, our real interest rate was higher. Remember also that investment is a function of the real interest rate. So as it becomes, in essence, costlier to invest, people are going to invest less. That decreases planned expenditure and decreases aggregate demand, all from expected deflation. And that decrease in aggregate demand decreases income and output, causing a fall in GDP. We can also see destabilizing effects if the deflation is unexpected. And so Irving Fisher, the same guy behind the Fisher equation, put forth this debt deflation theory and said that a sudden unexpected decrease in prices arbitrarily transfers purchasing power away from borrowers toward lenders. And in response to this, borrowers would spend less and lenders would spend more. Basically, borrowers are net poorer, lenders are net wealthier. And so if a borrower's propensity to spend, if their marginal propensity to consume is larger than lenders, then aggregate demand is going to fall in response to this unexpected deflation. And thus, our total income and total output would fall. And so a lot of time and a lot of research has been put into understanding what happened during the Great Depression. In reality, a lot of economists now accept the monetary hypothesis for the Great Depression. And policymakers know a lot more about what not to do during a crisis. The Fed knows not to let the money supply fall during a recession. Fiscal policymakers know not to raise taxes or not to cut spending when the economy starts to face headwinds. At the same time, we've put in place things like federal deposit insurance so that if a bank fails, you can still get your money out. A bank failure doesn't mean that you were essentially broke. And lastly, we see a lot of automatic stabilizers for fiscal policy now. Basically, as the economy starts to slow, there are a lot of different policies that immediately kick in and start to increase spending to counteract what could potentially be a leftward shift in the IS curve. And so the chair of the Fed during the Great Recession, Ben Bernanke, was a scholar of the Great Depression. He studied the Great Depression primarily throughout his academic career to learn how not to, to make sure it didn't happen again. So if we look at 2008 and 2009, we start to see some of the same basic ingredients that we had seen in the Great Depression. Real GDP started to fall in 2009 and unemployment really significantly increased. And similar to the 1920s, the Federal Reserve had, before the crisis, had really low interest rates. We'd had a subprime mortgage crisis, the housing bubble burst, we had a lot of falling stock prices, some banks failed, and there was a significant decline in consumer confidence. And so if we look before the crisis, we can see that housing prices, this purple line here, were constantly going up, that people were investing a ton in housing. And at the same time, interest rates were really low. It was really easy to invest in housing. But in 2008 and 2009, we saw that foreclosures spiked. And because foreclosures spiked, people couldn't pay on their house anymore. And the house price index, the price of a house in the United States, significantly decreased. Taken together, this is going to decrease household wealth and should decrease total consumer spending. At the same time, we saw bank failures significantly increase throughout 2008 and 2009. So bank failures were not particularly common in the, early in the early 2000s. But by the late 2000s, we were seeing bank failures seemingly everywhere. But in 2009, we saw over 140 bank failures. In 2010, even more than that. At the same time, a lot of stock price indices started to go down. The Dow Jones went down, S&P 500. So people were net poor because their stocks were going down, just like we saw in the Great Depression. 
all of this happened while consumer sentiment was starting to fall. Basically, as people became less optimistic about the economy, they started to roll back spending and save for a, a better day. Taken together, this led to a significant decrease in total spending, total GDP, and a significant increase in unemployment. Now, the Fed, in response to this, cut interest rates really, really significantly. They basically made sure through programs like quantitative easing that we didn't have a decline in the money supply throughout 2009 and 2010. And as a result, we saw growth start to return fairly quickly. We didn't have an entire decade where growth was really, really low. That's primarily because the Federal Reserve stepped in and didn't make the same mistakes that it made during the Great Depression. 